More than 30 years ago, the project on the history of black writing began its investment in preserving and recovering the history of black writing. Today, we remain committed to creating critical spaces for teaching, learning, researching, and presenting black literature, both in the US and globally. As such, we are very pleased to present the eighth and final webinar of black poetry after the black arts movement, a summer institute funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our special guest today is the poet Nathaniel Mackey, Reynolds Prize Chair of Creative Writing at Duke University. I am Pete Moore, PhD candidate at Duke University, where we are holding this virtual seminar today. In order to facilitate the interaction with our guests today, we will be using the Q&A tool as the place to collect questions for the poet to answer in the course of the webinar. You should see this in the upper left hand corner of your webinar window. You are encouraged to use this function actively. And now I'm going to introduce our poet today. For a writer whose work has been called mercurial, obscure, elliptical, and demanding, it is not difficult at all to find the thread that connects the various dimensions of Nathaniel Mackey's celebrated career. Through his numerous collections of poetry, his multi-volume epistolary novel, his scholarly monograph, numerous essays and talks, his editorship of Hambone, a magazine of experimental writing, and his stewardship of the long-running radio program, Tanganyika Strut, Professor Mackey has articulated a deep and expansive exploration into what he calls the making of Black improvisatory music. One hears this in both of the ongoing serial poems, Song of the Andambulu and Mu. One can hear this in the writings of multi-instrumentalist N, the protagonist of Mackey's fiction project, From a Broken bro Bottle, Traces of Perfume Still Emanate which follows the exploits of N's band, the Mythic Horn Society, also known as the Deconstructive Woodwind Chorus, also known as the East Bay, East Bay Dread Society. And one can hear it in the finely tuned attention that he dedicates to the analysis of his many visionary ancestors and interlocutors, from John Coltrane and Amiri Baraka to Wilson Harris and Charles Olson. It is rare that a writer of such intense focus a writer committed to the esoteric and the opaque enjoys the level of critical success that has created Professor Mackey at every stage of his career. His first full-length collection, Eroding Witness, from 1985, was selected for the National Poetry Series by Michael Harper. His second installment of the ongoing fiction project entitled uh, Jabot Bagusta's Run garnered the Whitting Award and his widely praised 2006 book of poems, Splay Anthem, won the prestigious National Book Award. Add to this list the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Stephen Henderson Award, and Yale's 2015 Bollingen Prize for Poetry. While the list of awards gives one a sense of Mackey's importance to the landscape of modern and contemporary verse culture, to give you a sense of his utility to writers, musicians, theorists, and fellow travelers, I would like to borrow a phrase from Robert Duncan a poet Mackey has written about extensively and published in Hambone. In 1965 at the Berkeley Poetry Conference, Duncan introduces keynote poet Charles Olson by referring to him as the big fire source. In 2015, the very same can be said of Mackey. About his influence, poet and scholar Fred Moten has said, the community of black experimental writers, the ones trying to study that work, it's not the biggest community within black intellectual life, but those of us in it, we were these Nate Mackeyites scattered across the country. I met a lot of my good friends in the academy and the search for more of them. Within that subset of folks who are thinking about the fundamental questions regarding black art and black social life, there's no one more significant than Nate. On that note, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Nathaniel Mackey. Thank you, Pete. Well, it's really great to be here with all you folks out there. 
and with you, Pete. Okay, so I'd like to start today by asking a question that pertains directly to the focus of this webinar series, which is Black Poetry After the Black Arts Movement. I know your first short collection, Four for Train, comes out in 1978, which is a few years after the movement reaches its height. But I was wondering if you could talk about your personal relationship to the Black Arts Movement and maybe its impact on your writing. Yeah, the Black Arts Movement was um, really at its height in the 1960s, arose in the 1960s, late 1960s. And it was around the time that, um, that I started writing. Um, I was in college at the time, and one of the poets that um, I paid very close attention to and who uh, got me started in many ways um, uh, to look at poetry and writing more generally as something I might want to pursue uh, was a Mary Baraka, uh, then known as Leroy Jones. Uh, William Carlos Williams was, was, was there as well. And of course, um, Baraka, you know, was a central figure in the Black Arts Movement. Um, but I've been paying attention to um, things that were happening. Um, one of the places that you could see what was happening was in uh, the, uh, the Johnson publication, uh, Negro Digest, it changed its name to Black World. Um, and I, I read that regularly. And in fact, um, my first nationally published poem was published in, in um, I think it was still called Negro Digest. Um, and that was in 1967. Um, and so there was a lot going on in those pages that talking about um, a, a new sense of um, what uh, black art could do and should do. And um, it was, you know, taking a, a global perspective, I think it was there that I first um, read about the work of Aimé Césaire, for example, and Negritude. So I was very much um, keyed in to, to, to what was, was going on out in Chicago via um, the, uh, that publication. Uh, I remember Carolyn Rogers' work uh, I first encountered in those pages, Sonia Sanchez's work I first read in, in, in those pages as well. Uh, Baraka I had come to um, elsewhere, but uh, he uh, played an increasingly prominent role. Um, in that movement and um, appeared more and more regularly in uh, Black World, as it uh, came to be called. So it was a very formative period for me. And the Black Arts Movement was um, uh, um, very much a part of the mix of stuff that I was paying attention to and, and, and that I was, you know, sorting out, you know, <laughs> sifting my way through in trying to come to some sense of what, what you know, what, what I might do, if I might do anything mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in this thing called writing. Um, and it was, um, it was something I, I, um, I was wrestling with. Um, I wrote a, 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 I was an undergrad at Princeton. I was an English major. Uh, I graduated in 1969 and uh, we had to write a, a senior thesis. Um, and I wrote mine on, on, on Baraka. Uh, I called it the conversion of Leroy Jones. And a lot of that had to do with looking at the way he articulated his transition from uh, being a, a member of what was called the New American Poetry to being uh, one of the poets, um, leading poet and leading figure, playwright, et cetera, et cetera, in the Black Arts Movement. Um, I remember writing a paper on the Black aesthetic for a seminar on Black writers that was taught by um, a black faculty member from Rutgers who came down to Princeton, uh, Cecilia Drury, and um, and and I, it was called from a number of a number of places. So it was something that interested me, and um, I, I, you know, I didn't buy into everything, you know, but there were definitely things that 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 that, that left an impact uh, on me and resonated with inclinations that I already had. Yeah. So in following up on that, one of the resonances that I kind of see, and I think other people have written about, is that, you know, Black arts writing is often thought of as dedicated to a collective search for ancestry and a new 
um, a new writing of history, a, an imagination of diasporic heritage. And this is something that exists at the forefront of your work, it seems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk about Leroy Jones's conversion from the New American to the Black Arts Movement. And it seems like one of those bridges, or at least in your work, between those two contexts is the serial poem form. And so I'm wondering maybe how does the, the, the work of the serial poem or the serial form, um, how is that suited for the task of rewriting history or engaging with this diasporic heritage? Um, maybe is, is the concept of tradition too large for a single poem? Or is it that the serial poem has a more nuanced approach to loss and restoration? You know, curious what you have to say. Well, I think that because um, so much of our history was not on the table, uh, engaging with these questions of, of ancestry and lineage, genealogy, uh, necessarily put one in a, an, a, an exploratory position. I mean, you had, you had to search out and look for things. And the serial poem with its emphasis and valorization of provisionality, uh, you know, is a, is, is, a, is a good medium for that, an apt medium for that. Um, open form, a kind of open-ended search, um, you know, uh, must, you know, most of the stuff that, that that search got me into, got it, us into, was not on the curriculum. Yeah. You know, uh, we had to search it out mm -hmm. and, we, you know, we had to bring it in uh, as a kind of contraband. So, you know, the fact that it was, you know, not on the table meant that, um, you know, you had to go look for it. And so that theme of quest and search you know, got an even heavier dimension to it, an even more relevant dimension to it. And the form that would, that would accommodate that, that, that would lend itself to that, um, uh, for me, seemed to be serial, the, 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 the long poem, the open poem. I was also, of course, as, you know, I was also, of course, listening to, to Black music mm -hmm. uh, very, very attentively. And I was struck by the move toward long form among the musicians that, that, that I was uh, listening to and, and moved by and influenced by. Um, you know, going away, you know, techno, you know, technological means made it possible to record, you know, beyond the three minute limit. And, and that had long been, been the case. And you began to get, to get longer pieces. Notably, Ellington, Ellington had moved from doing, you know, short pieces, you know, to the various suites. And uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, a lot of the critics, the jazz critics, uh, all of whom were white, mm -hmm. um, um, thought this was a, a, a pretentious move on Ellington's part, that he was taking himself too seriously by doing these longer works. Um, so that interested me and, and told me something about uh, long form uh, and content, form and content, and, and a kind of prohibition uh, on long form. Uh, when it came to us, you know, that this was something more serious, um, that maybe uh, we weren't, you know, we weren't thought of as being, you know, uh, able to do or, uh, or, or being appropriate for us to do it. And that seemed to go, that seemed to be a, a formal um, push that went hand in hand with a lot of what we talk about as Black consciousness and the radicalism of the 60s. Um, um, and a lot of things that we think about as, as, as uh, the ferment that, that the Black Arts Movement was an artistic uh, wing of. You not only, you know, following Ellington, you began to see long works by, especially by jazz musicians, concept albums eventually, even that gets into pop music. You know, Stevie Wonder begins to do, you know, uh, concept albums, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, where all the pieces, you know, fit in some kind of way. But I'd seen this earlier in something like uh, Charles Mingus's "The Black Lady in the Center," uh, in the black, the black center. What what is it? The black scene in the center, center lady. lady. Yeah, which uh, was uh, just just like um, heavy, heavy, eye-opening uh, thing for me. Uh, Coltrane's "Meditations," uh, "A Love Supreme," uh, "Ascension." So this idea, I, I more and more got the sense that, and then Cecil Taylor's work. But more and more, I got the sense that. 
uh, this move to long form uh, uh, among the musicians was in and, in and of itself saying something and was responding to you know a need and a, and, and a, and a, uh, a, 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 a further movement that that need to need, need to, to be made and of course um, I was reading uh, the modernist and the postmodernist poets in, in the American tradition. Um, William Carlos Williams's Patterson was, was something I read early on and followed that up by, you know, seeing the Cantos and later HD's work. And then, of course, I was reading um, uh, Olson's Maximus poems and, and, and Duncan's pa passages. So, you know, what struck me was this, um, was this intersection of, of, of um, modernist and postmodernist experimental poetics uh, and its emphasis on uh, uh, ongoingness and seriality and the, um, the, the you know the, the the long work the big work the big canvas and uh, this thing that was happening uh, among especially among black musicians so um, it kind of crept up on me but when I look back on it um, I can see that you know I was sort of a sitting duck for it <laughs> uh, it was, um, you know, I, the, you can see it. You, you can see it in, in eroding witness. Yeah. The other way that a song of the Andumbulu ends, you know, at seven. But I, in you know, and at that point, I thought it it was over. But I came back to it, and now it's you know, it's it's one of the ongoing, you know, uh, 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 series that I, that I write in. Um, but you can also see it in the in the final section of that book, uh, Septet for the End of Time. Um, which began as, you know, one poem, um, Cap uh, Capricorn Rising. And, um, and, and I began it just to, that it would be that one poem. I didn't think of it as part of a, a set or a suite. But that phrase uh, that starts, it, um, I, I wake up, uh, uh, that became a kind of thing I returned to in each poem. And there ended up being eight of them. And there was also a play between um, the title Septet, which suggests seven, and the fact that there were eight of them. So the uh, incongruity or discre discrepant engagement between seven and eight also had, had something to say about, about um, uh, a discomfort with closure, a sense of, 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 of closure not fitting, uh, a seven that turns into an eight, and it didn't really have to end there. It just did as a matter of convenience. So um, over the years, I, I came to see that uh, I, you know that that the work was open in that way and, and ongoing, and 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 uh, it was really with Splay Anthem, um, you know, that I that that I came to really you know um, uh, announcedly um, mm -hmm. embrace that and 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 say that well you know my work is now at least my work in, in verse is now these two intertwined poems, uh, Mu and Song of the Andumbulu. Hmm. That that reminds me of something that a lot of people talk about with your work is that very early on, I mean, you reference eroding witness very early on, um, you come to what we might think of as a signature tone or a, a, a style that is characteristic of your um, entire corpus. And you come to that very early and you talk about, you know, having a sense pretty early on that there's a a poem of the life that you write. And given the relative consistency of your work, I wonder if you could talk about breakthroughs, like moments that stood out to you as changing your conception of the poem or changing how you relate to seriality or um, changing your, your, your intentions. Mm -hmm. Well, Breakthrough, um, one of them I just spoke about, which was uh, Septet for the other right. time, um, moving from seeing that as, uh, you know, just one mm -hmm. uh, poem uh, to uh, a poem that was a part of a set of poems. Um, another, an earlier breakthrough through mo moment for me was uh, the Coltrane poem, On a Darwin's Day Begun. Uh, it's, it's, it was the longest poem I'd ever written at that point. And, and um, there was something about the way that that poem came to me over time that um, you know that that altered my sense of what the the time frame for for writing is. Okay. Um, 
but you know there there would be other breakthroughs um beginning to write the letters that became from a broken bottle traces of perfume right. still emanate um that you know I, I didn't know that that would turn into what it has turned into, but it, it it did seem to be a breakthrough in that I wanted uh, I, I wanted to get more stuff on the page and I and uh, and more uh, more more range uh, of, of of registering tone and that kind of thing, and um, at that point um, it wasn't available to me in verse, and so I, I used prose and. Um, and in fact, the first instances of that occur in Song of the Angambulu and the Voting Witness. But then um, the, the formation of the band in, in one of the letters, and then it just goes off in a, in, in a, in a, in a different direction with a, a Better Than Horn book. Uh, that was definitely a, a breakthrough. Uh, it didn't come all at, at once, but um, it, you know, it, it definitely opened up another another vein of of, uh, of, uh, of of writing for me and um, and that vein of writing came in, in time to have an impact on on my poetry um, the, um, um, the the poems you know have taken some of the things I've learned from writing that prose into them and um, in some ways uh, I began by by largely taking Taking things that I had learned from the poems um, to generate a certain kind of prose, um, and that sort of multi-generic uh, moment that is that work um, brought other kinds of uh, ranges of articulation in, and um, I began to see over time that uh, that they could um, be brought into verse. So the whole so the so the impulse behind the, that going, going to the prose, to the fiction, was to, to get to things that uh, at that point, uh, my conception of poetry, of verse, um, wasn't open enough uh, to accommodate. And then, um, you know, in a poetically just way, that prose comes to, you know, teach, you know, the poetry something. Mm -hmm. um, so those would be, you know, kinds of breakthroughs. Um, other things is just you know um, the breakthroughs of of time of, you know um, things come with time <laughs> you know um, <laughs> I don't remember saying it but Peter Gizzy always reminds me that um, when we when we met back in 1990 or something um, he was a grad student at Brown and I was doing a, a writer in residence stint there for a week or two and um, he was sort of my escort. He reminds me that I um, uh, that I told him that um, um, every decade um, uh, brings its own information. Mm. Every de every decade brings different information, and um, uh, I found out that that's true. <laughs> 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 and uh, so one of the things that's made for, for you know for breakthroughs for me in the work is 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 time. Yeah. You know? uh, and um, you know, the decades bringing their information, things going on in the outer world, bringing their information, things going on in one's own body, bringing information, you know, the, the life changes one goes through and those sorts of things. Um, you know, definitely a, a breakthrough point. Um, and, you know, um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail about, about those, but, um, but they're there, mm -hmm. they're there. So I, I want to shift to thinking about the introduction to Blue Fossa, and, and in there you, you give this really beautiful reading of the word pull, pulling out of thin air an entire host of connotations. One pulls the strings of the lyre and the music pulls one into an experience of possession and trance. I feel like we could talk forever about the last line to pull the song or the last line of the paragraph, to pull the song is to be taken over by it. But I wanna ask you something a bit more general. Pull exemplifies, in my mind, a tendency in your poetry to linger among the monosyllables, the short words. I'm thinking about words like scrum, nod, rag, soul, which appear in again and again throughout your work, often at the end of poems or at places of great emphasis. And I wonder if maybe you could talk about the pull monosyllables have over your writing 
Is it musical? Is it concerted effort to revitalize everyday words that carry perhaps overlooked meanings? Um, <clears throat> it's the pull of the syllables, certainly, you know, at one level. Um, Jacques Cursil, the, the musician, the trumpeter, was here last week, and uh, he, he gave a performance that, you know, included him reading uh, Edouard Glissant's, some, some of Edouard Glissant's work, and, um, and also playing the trumpet. And we were talking about it afterwards, because um, I asked him, um, how does his reading of Glissant's work compare with Glissant's reading of it? And he says it's very different, that uh, uh, Glissant doesn't linger in the syllables mm. in the way that he, he, he does. And, um, and I think that the, um, the pull that, that one, one dimension of the pull that, that, that I was talking about is you know, the, the, the pull of the syllables and the uh, involvement that that leads to, which is an attention to the play of syllables. Mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to you know, stuff that poetry's always been doing, but that, uh, that Pound, for example, talked about as the, the tone leading of, vow of vowels. So that pull, and, um, and it, it has a kind of possession quality to it, or what Abdul Ibrahim calls transmission, um, in that you, in some ways, cultivate a, uh, a trusting relationship to the resources and the dynamics of the medium itself, the language, uh, the way in which uh, the syllables call to mind other syllables, not necessarily the same syllables, but related syllables. And uh, rhyme is the obvious way in which poetry does that. But of course, there's assonance and there's alliteration and, and those other things. And attending, attending to, to language at that level um, leads to a kind of exploratory path in which one happens upon things, discovers things, feels one is given things that one would not otherwise get to. And that pull, you know, the pull of song, uh, you know, what the, um, um, that, that uh, anthropological work that I referred to uh, and get that term from, um, what's it called? Uh, the Holly, uh, Anyway, I can't remember right now. But anyway, that's what they're talking about. The, the, the pull of the music uh, being caught up in a kind of, um, kind of sonic dynamic that um, shakes and loosens, you know, the, the ratiocinative will, um, you know, the realm of, of, of intent and so on and so forth. So the, uh, that kind of way of writing, that kind of way of, of, of being receptive um, is one of the things that, that, that when I read about, uh, um, you know, the, this group of, of, uh, of, of, of women in the Sudan uh, that came to mind for me, and analogies with, with, uh, between poetic uh, uh, inspiration and uh, possession states uh, have been made, you know, in time immemorial. Um, but anyway, um, the, the sense that there's a, a dynamic that is uh, grounded in incompletion and that uh, moves through incompletion and, and draw, draws, one's, draws one along, pushes one along, is what's bound up in that, that, that figure of the pull. Hmm. Um, in an earlier webinar, um, poet Nikki Finney said that she saw it as her job as a poet to witness and report on the current state of worldly affairs. And I know that in your interview with Ed Foster, at one point, you describe yours as a language of reflection. Um, you were talking specifically about prose there, but I think that there's elements of that that apply to the poetry as well. And I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between witnessing and reflection and 
is one more essential for your understanding of your role as a poet and if there even is a role of the poet for you? I think each poet decides what his or her role is. Sure. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure I've made up my mind what, <laughs> what my, what my, uh, what my, what my sense of that is. Um, witnessing um, is, you know, what we all do. Um, my first book is called, is called Eroding Witness. Um, and even in that title, there's a bit of consternation about um, what witnessing can do and um, how true one can, one can be to witnessing, how true witnessing can be to what it wants to report. Um, and, but also the, the factor of time and that, you know, witness wears out uh, and has to be um, altered and uh, modified to speak to new conditions. Um, and I, I'm probably, I think I, as I've written, you know, over decades now, um, I, I felt the way in which I've been witnessing uh, a lot more than I did at first. Um, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a sense that in any special way I was witnessing, uh, other than that, you know, any medium uh, is a transmission um, of uh, perceptions, reflections, uh, information, you know, gotten from experience, gotten from the world uh, through the person who has gotten them to other people. Uh, and that's what I mean by saying we're always witnessing. Um, the, uh, the application of that term to, you know, specific kinds of public events um, that we've seen, you know, in recent decades, uh, maybe obscured that fact. And um, so that we have something called a, a poetry of witness uh, associated, you know, with, with Carolyn Fauché and, and the anthologies that she did. And um, I have not felt myself to be um, so explicitly an instance of that as um, many people, you know, that I could name, you know, would be. Um, but I do think that there, that we are antenna and we do pick up things. And it's, it's, it's tonal, it's vibrational, it's not simply at the level of declaration and it's not simply at the level of pointing. And I'm struck by how so much work that isn't necessarily purporting to witness or report what's going on in some larger sense of the world does that anyway. And again, I think that to work as an artist, you have to have a trusting sense that you're going to do that, that you're going to do that, not necessarily in some prescribed way, not necessarily in some preconceived way, but that you're going to do that. And that's going to happen um, if you are, um, if, if you hone in on yourself and, and your life and the demands of the medium, uh, you will do that. And it's, um, you know, even as uh, inward a poet as, as uh, Robert Creeley, for example, ends up, his work ends up doing that to, to some extent. Uh, and sometimes even the more outward poets, uh, their work does that in, 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 in the more private, uh, what we think of as private, um, you know, uh, poems that they write. So it's, um, it's something I, 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 I do think about. Uh, we all think about it. Um, and I do think it's going on. And I think it's going on more than some of the you know, manifestos about it uh, recognize. It was one of the things that, one of the, one of the problems I had about with, with um, uh, uh, the, some of the, 
the black arts um, uh, dis discourse was the prescriptive nature of it. And often uh, prescription from, from people who were not practicing artists themselves. Mm -hmm. you, you know, black art needs to do this, black artists need to do that. They need to, you know, um, uh, Ron Paringa would be a good example. You know, his, his writings, you know, that, you know, um, you know, black painters, um, you know, are not to, you're not supposed to paint, paint still lives, you know. Uh, you, you know, if you paint, you know, a bowl of fruit, uh, you know, it should be, it should include the hand of a black guerrilla fighter reaching for the orange, you know, <laughs> to nourish himself uh, in the struggle. That kind of um, um, very, very simplified sense of, of how uh, art witnesses and how, in, uh, how, how art interacts with and transforms life, um, you know, just, just didn't, um, it just didn't jive with, with, with what I saw going on, you know, in art, in art or life. So, um, like I said, I, it seemed to me that the artists who spoke most deeply to me um, were on a, uh, were exploring and, 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 and seeking, and were very humble about, um, about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no grand pronouncements about um, uh, uh, about what they were doing, and um, and it's almost as if they were kind of feeling like, well, um, if some of these grand things happen as a kind of byproduct of what I'm doing, um, so be it, and more power to it, and I would be happy that that happened, but I will not presume, you know, to say that I can simply declare that. Uh, my work has that kind of reach and that kind of resonance. Um, I, 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 I might want it to have and, and do want it to have, but um, I will stop short of, you know, announcing, you know, that it has it just because, you know, I've declared it to have it or, to, or I've declared that I want it to have it. Mm -hmm. So that's been the spirit in which I, I, I've worked um, and um, it continues to be. And, um, and I do feel that, um, you know, the, uh, the wider scope that um, um, I've wanted my work to have um, um, comes in um, and um, it's, you know, it has come in, you know, when it felt it was time to come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, that old business about the muse and, you know, you're not really being in charge. Uh, you know, we have to keep that in mind, especially yeah. when we start dealing with prescriptive notions of, about, you know, like, you know, uh, that we can dictate um, what's gonna happen in the arts that we practice. And certainly, you know, uh, have to be wary of dictating to others what's gonna, what's gonna happen in the arts that they practice. Well, we have quite a few questions here. Um, but I, 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 would, I would really be remiss if we didn't get a chance to hear you read. So uh, I want to get to these questions, but I'd like to first, if you have something you'd like to read for us. Yes, um, I'm going to read from Blue Fossa, which is uh, the book that just uh, came out uh, a few months ago. And I'm going to read a poem that's in the Song of the Andumbulu series. It's about halfway through the book, a little more than halfway through the book. And it's um, Song of the Andumbulu uh, 101. Mr. P sat humming inside a house overlooking the sea. Cracks in the window, a draft in the room. It was something for the dead. The dead might have said. The dead said to be dying of thirst. Something blew in, something blew through. Mr. P pressed a digitated, hummed. It was Dogon 101. We were there again. Pinched, come to shout, we were there. Same note, new octave, there again. Lone Coast Sea Cliff, the reach of Bondiagara. P, the prestidigitator, hummed. I fell away, Mr. P's apprentice, 
Mr. P was Mr. Press, I thought. It was either hedge or be caught out or even both, it was intimated. Thus it was that I'd have come there, Powder Keg Planet, year 64 since my arrival. Two eights met and multiplied. It was one, it was the other. It was neither, it was both. All I could say was it was. I heard waves, I heard a symphony, strings welling up the swell of salt off Lone Coast. Lone Coast, no coast, no way to say it was. Mr. P corrected me. No coast, not so much as no known coast. Lone and no known were in it together. Golem-like, lone and no known walked hand in hand. So spoke Mr. P. Please, please, Mr. P, we begged. Don't say that. Lone would never be no gnomes, kith and consort. Lone would never be that way. Silly, but so it went. Pilgrim's progress, no progress. Nothing to go on about. Otherwise, it was all copacetic. We had some shabby on the box and we were moving. A trek we could have sworn we coaxed music from. Called what condolence we could. Dirt slid from cliffs as we drove up the coast. It was real, neither not nor not known, but escorting us. Highway 101 where it ran with one, Pismo Beach, Shabby on the box, the next world we were almost in. Algiers, it might have been, we were in. So real we wept, remembering. Resemblance did us in. I wrote a letter to myself, remanding the hand of Mr. P, my head inside his head, inside my head, correcting his, him inside mine, correcting me. Mr. P was Mr. Past. I was rating the present. Silly that it came to that. Mr. P was the outermost me, I wanted to say. The inner me's mime and remit, I made it seem. Soon come key to the highway, identities, ruse, and regret. I was beginning to be less attached, I thought. I wrung my hands inside the car, wanted out, we were welded in. Annuncia riding shotgun, feet propped on the dashboard, everyone we knew bunched up and back. Soft Annuncia's hard feet led the way, we were heading north. Nothing if not love's high cry transported us. Love's high cry, love's collapse. Recalled when the undersides rise meant something sexual. Now, not that, but catastrophe, death. No coast if never to see Lone Coast again. Shell Beach lay to our left. A low tolling lay left as well. Bell, buoy, low groan, omen, gruff. Not yet there, no matter where we were. We of the phonographic diaspora motored on. We of the inconsequent arrival. We of the interminable skid. Mr. P sat in the back seat, bunched with everyone else. Please, please, Mr. P, I said, looking back as we began to swerve. Swerved and spun, and we pulled into Los Gatos, back where the song began. In the dream, I saw we dreamt our way there. Silly as that, dream silly. Mr. P met Mr. DJ. Silly as that, we pulled in, 1971. I sat in a room spinning discs, an impromptu Taoist. Again, where the Andumbulu first beckoned. Smoke wafting the brunt of our dismay. Bailed out by dreaming, awoke back where we were. We lay on stretchers, paramedics, toted us away. 
Catholic adornment lay to our right, lyricless music, an old soul's love we'd have known. A man alone in Lisbon, Solito we'd have said in Spain, Kareen in the car, though we might, we sang, orphans no matter which way. The chorus lay underground, chthonic murmur, chronic insistence not to subside, it seemed. Thank you so much. That poem is it's really wonderful. It's, it's so visceral yet um, uh, enamored with thought. Um, you know, there's so many ways to talk about it, but the thing that comes to mind and it kind of addresses one of the questions that we have, I have a question or a, a kind of a declaration. Please let him talk about the legacy of Hambone. And so there are all these kind of paraliterary things that exist in your biography, the, the DJing, the Tanganyika strut, we have kind of a reference maybe to here. Um, and then also your curation of Hambone. And I wonder if maybe we could use this poem as a as a way of jumping into those aspects of your work and then mm -hmm. also the way in which those work that those aspects inform your work mm -hmm. yeah well there's a reference you know the uh, uh what is it something about being a Taoist yeah. spinning spinning discs uh I worked at a, a radio station in Los Gatos in California its call letters were K-T-A-O K-D-A-O and, <laughs> and that's where I um it had, it had this wonderful record library, uh, just all kinds of stuff from all over the world. Um, and that's where I, in, uh, that's where I first saw and heard the uh, recording of Dogon music, Le Dogon, mm -hmm. the Okoro label. And that's where I first heard the song of Yandung, Andung Bulu. So in 101, I was kind of, you know, uh, sort of returned to one, <laughs> you know, return to beginnings, you know. Um, but um, the stuff, you know, I, I've been, I did radio for years. I started with a jazz show when I was an undergrad at Princeton. Um, I had a, a musical mix program uh, on a station in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, when I taught there in the mid 70s. Um, then the long run with um, uh, KUSP uh, in, in, in Santa Cruz while I was in grad school uh, in the early 70s. I had a program at, at KDAO in Los Gatos. And, um, Besides being fun, <laughs> it's been important for me to, um, to do that, obviously, I've done it so much. And, and maybe that's another kind of witnessing mm. that we don't think about when we think of that term. Um, it's, it's a kind of cultural work, obviously, you're putting into the air uh, sounds, you know, that you think need to be there, or, you know, sounds that are, you're sh and you're sharing with the world, you know, these resources that have been, that have been important to you. Um, so there's a the work of doing a radio program. It's I've compared it to writing a poem. It's it's um, you're making segues and you're stitching things together. Um, I mean the word the word rhapsody goes back to you know to the stitch. So um, putting sets together, um, segues and all that kind of stuff. So it's very it's it's, it's it's like writing poetry. It's also uh, it's also an act of anthologizing. Mm -hmm. uh, each each set, each show is an anthology um, where likeness and difference, you know, uh, are high, highlighted and are part of the weave. Um, so these activities seem like you know variations on something that they have in common. Um, and so editing Hambone was you know was a more you know specifically literally uh, work when a, a work of, 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 of editing um, and it's been it was important for me to do that because again um, it's witnessing it's saying this is stuff that there's some kind of some kind of thread that holds you know these writers and these musicians whose interviews I run in the magazine there's something there that's that's holding them together it may only be me but it's at least that. Um, and um, it's saying this is, you know, these are important spots on my, on my map. Um, and, and that's the way, um, you know, that's the way Hambone, you know, has worked for me. 
um, it, it it's a kind of community that's being created. And, and I've met people through editing Hambone that I, you know, um, didn't know before. And um, I've included people whose work I knew before I started to edit Hambone. And um, but it has it was a way for me to be in touch with uh, a larger company of of, of, of of artists beyond beyond the local place where I happen to be. But it was also um, a way of, uh, of of putting something uh, on the table and say, okay, here's my mix. You know, uh, it's not the only mix. You know, mm -hmm. but here's mine. Yeah. Uh, and um, and you know, it's one's doing that. You know, when one does a radio program, you're doing it when you write a, a poem. You're doing it when you write a letter to the angel of dust. You're doing it when you put a sil syllabus together. You know, we're always doing that. Yep. You know, we're constantly doing, you know, we're, we're constantly, you know, creating a canon. You know, you know, uh, we don't, you know, we don't get to call it that because, you know, um, you know, we don't have enough institutional power behind us to call it that, but that's what we're doing. And I think, you know, you know, and that this is happening during the time where there were the so-called canon wars probably makes, you know, some kind of sense. That, sure. You know, it was my way of kind of saying, well, here's a, here's an active way to be uh, engaged in those kinds of questions. And, you know, and, and, and on the, and on a, and, and perhaps on a more human scale, at least a more personal scale uh, than, you know, the kinds of uh, institutional um, frameworks that, that the questions were, were, were mainly taken, taking place. You know, so, I mean, I, I looked at, I mean, I, one of the things I admired about Baraka is that, you know, he did stuff. I mean, he, you know, <laughs> I mean, he started his own magazines. You know, he, he published other people that he thought it was important to, you know, to, to, get, to, to give a platform to. And he continued to do that, you know. He started, you know, uh, uh, you know, he was involved with culture, Floating Bear. Um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, anyway, but, but various magazines over the course of, you know, and then Jihad Productions that he did. So in my own, you know, more humble way, I was just, you know, uh, you know, because I had a teaching job, I had to yeah, give a lot yeah. of time to. I was trying to do some stuff, you know, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, just sort of add, you know, my mix to the larger mix. So we have a question here from Miriam Graham, who asks, are there some new directions in which we see contemporary poetry going that we are not giving more attention to and should? unacknowledged directions that you've noticed? Um, well, I think that's been happening for a quite a while. Right. Um, the, um, I mean, I can't understand why Ed Roberson's work, for example, d doesn't get uh, more, attention, more attention than it has. Um, it just seemed to me that coming out of those books that he did, uh, for University of Pittsburgh Press, and then um, moving into um, um, uh, lucid interval as interval music uh, in in the in the I think, that, I think he did that in the 70s, uh, or maybe it was early 80s. But that that kind of direction um, is still new, I think, uh, and 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 under appreciated, under examined. Um, it's it's um it's it's something i try not to think about too much you know what's getting attention mm -hmm. and and what's not getting attention um I, I think one does one's work and beyond that one tries to make a place for the work that one finds important and resonant whether it's doing a radio program or you know hosting a reading series uh, editing a magazine. Um, and, you know, it's not so much that, you know, I think that the things I published in Hambone, you know, uh, you know, represent a new direction that hasn't gotten enough attention, but there does seem some kind of gestalt there. And I'm not sure I have a name for it other than Hambonista. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but some of the Hambonistas have been quite, you know, quite celebrated. So I can't say that, you know, it's totally a matter of, of neglect. Um, but no, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't, um, you know, we all know that there's something out there that's being discussed in poetry 
uh, that you know, uh, whose name I will pass over in silence. Um, but um, but there's some things that could be given less attention, I guess. Um, seems like we're coming up pretty short on time here, but I want to ask you kind of a a very short question that I've that is often um, been in my mind uh, or often come to mind. Those who know you know that music is essential to your composition, but those who know you also know that you're quite a sports fan. Having played football and ran track in high school, um, inquiring minds want to know, which is a better companion when you're writing, jazz or sports talk radio? <laughs> <laughs> depends on the poem. It depends on what I'm writing. Um, one of the things I like about sports talk radio is that it's, it's live language. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the way people are speaking and, you know, uh, and it's, it's not just, you know, talk about sports, but it's talk as sport and, uh, and, and talk as performance. So I don't necessarily write while listening uh, uh, to sports talk radio, but, uh, but I used to listen to other forms of talk radio when I was a kid, you know, that were more wide ranging. Uh, sports just happens to have been, you know, something that uh, has taken over. But um, in, inquiring minds should know that you know both of those um, you know both bo both of those media both of those media you know ha have have things to teach us you know uh, music and and talk radio uh, talk as performance um, and you know um, I tend to um, sometimes write while listening to them but. Uh, Probably what's 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 more active in my writing is um, the way in which you can store those things, um, and they will come back to you later um, with little with little lessons and influences that they bring to bear on your writing. Well, thank you so much for meeting being with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. And we'd like to thank. Uh, KU's Ermel Geringer Academic Resource Center staff for making today's webinar possible. A special thanks to our guest Nathaniel Mackey for being here today. Most of all, thanks to each of you for sharing this exciting event with us. A downloadable podcast from today's webinar will be available on our website soon. And don't forget to follow us online on the HBW website, on Twitter, and on our blog about events related to Black writing. Have a nice afternoon.